Protein has been a hot topic for a few years now, but for something that is so popular, if you try to look up information on how much should you consume per meal, when exactly should you be eating your protein, can too much protein do some damage to your organs, you're going to get a lot of contradicting, a lot of conflicting information and no clear answers in sight. This is why today we're going to be looking at recent scientific evidence and debunking five protein myths that you might have believed previously or even you might still be believing. All of the resources that I'm going to be using are going to be linked down in the description box below so that you can check them out for yourself. Enough rambling, let's get right into the video. We're going to start off with probably the most important myth out of the five and that is too much protein can cause adverse effects in kidneys of healthy subjects. A lot of emphasis on healthy subjects. This myth originates from the fact that people who suffer from chronic kidney conditions, specifically chronic kidney disease, have to follow a specific diet that is usually limited in protein, especially protein coming from red meat. This idea does not directly translate to healthy individuals that do not have any pre-existing kidney conditions. When a healthy individual consumes more protein than they usually do, their kidneys adapt by increasing the glomerular filtration rate, which is called hyperfiltration and is a normal adaptive response of our bodies so that it can deal with the extra protein that we're consuming. Additionally, some studies have examined protein intakes in the range between 3.2 and 4 point something grams per kilogram body weight per day in some athletes and no adverse effects on renal function were found. That does not mean to recommend to use such high protein intakes. I have a separate video on how much protein one should be consuming per day. I do not recommend such excessive values, mostly because if you eat that much protein, you're probably going to be freeing up space from one of the other two macronutrients that are just as important. And you would probably also suffer from a lot of flatulence and possibly constipation. If you've ever tried to rapidly increase your protein intake, you know what I'm talking about. However, the Institute of Medicine, the World Health Organization and different sport and nutrition organizations all support the fact that there is no legit scientific evidence or any scientific evidence for that matter that supports that increased protein intake is going to cause some type of adverse effect in healthy individuals. Again, second myth, and I had never heard of this prior to making the video, I found it in one research paper and I I can imagine somebody that just wants to discredit the entire high protein trend saying that. It is the hypothesis that having too much protein can do some damage to your bone health and decrease your bone density, which is kind of a wild statement considering that usually in the health space you see the opposite being talked about, that eating enough protein is going to improve your bone density, especially combined with resistance training, but the idea behind all of this is that hypothetically Hypothetically, if you eat more protein, you're eating more amino acids, which creates sort of an acidic load in your body and then calcium from your bones has to be released sort of to buffer that which would then lead to a decrease in bone mineral density. Here there are a lot of things to unpack that are inherently wrong. First, if there is indeed a higher urinary excretion that does not mean that it came 100% from the bones. That might be also coming from unabsorbed calcium from your food that your body is now getting rid of. Second thing, higher protein intakes have actually shown to boost the uptake from calcium from foods in the gut. And the third thing is that bones are actually a protein matrix. This is kind of the structural protein framework where all of the minerals are then incorporated. On top of all of that, eating enough amounts of protein also helps with the production of the hormone insulin-like growth factor 1, I'm pretty sure you've heard of it, which is also very important for bone formation. So you can see how there is much more evidence backing the 
opposite of that eating enough protein is probably going to help improve your bone health especially as one gets older and great improvements in bone mineral density are seen more prominently in elderly individuals that start getting enough protein especially when they combine that with some sort of resistance training the third myth is that you can only eat a limited amount of protein per meal since if you eat any more than that it is not going to be utilized your body is going to 100% get rid of it and not use it to build any muscle this entire idea originated from scientific papers on muscle protein synthesis which he found that there is indeed a threshold for protein ingested that stimulates muscle protein synthesis and after a certain amount it reaches a peak and it does not go upwards after that but this oversimplifies the entire anabolic processes that happen with our muscles it is not as simple as people make it out to be while muscle protein synthesis does indeed have a plateau and it cannot be further increased after that this is not the entire picture since you also have the process of muscle protein breakdown and muscle protein breakdown has been found to be suppressed with these higher protein intakes per meal so you can see how the net protein muscle balance is still going to be better if you have a little bit more protein than that and if you are used to having a meal with let's say a 50 grams of protein for lunch because it is easier for you to get your protein in at lunch that does not mean that those extra 10 grams or 15 grams of protein are going to be wasted in in fact, there are also a lot more factors that come into play. Older individuals that suffer already from anabolic resistance are going to have higher needs probably to achieve muscle protein synthesis because they cannot effectively make use of all of the amino acids that they're ingesting. It also might depend on the type of workout that you have done. If you trained all of the muscles in your body and you did a whole body workout or if you did an isolated chest workout, let's say. An isolated chest workout is going to require less protein to properly recover compared to a whole body workout. To highlight some newer research, a study from 2023 compared the ingestion of 100 grams of milk protein compared to a 25 gram dose of i think again milk protein and the outcome of the study was that the group that consumed the 100 grams of protein portion achieved a much different and much better anabolic response it was more prolonged compared to the other group that consumed the 25 gram dose i am not saying all of this as to promote that you should have 50 grams with every single meal i am explaining this to you so that you know Know that if you have a bit more of a skewed protein distribution most people do not consume a lot of their daily protein at breakfast and they consume more at lunch or dinner if this is also your pattern it is not that tragic and if you let's say consume 50 grams of protein at lunch or dinner your body is still probably going to make good use of it especially if you have high needs for recovery after some pretty good training sessions myth number four and this one is very popular it is the common belief that you need to consume your protein up to 60 minutes maximum after you work out otherwise you're not going to recover properly and see any gains this widespread belief emerged in the beginning from studies that were done on elderly people which concluded that there was a better anabolic response in these elderly people when they consumed the protein right after the workout compared to two hours after a meal first of all the case with elderly people and muscle protein synthesis is generally as you have already figured it out a lot more complex than it is for younger individuals and secondly there is a lot of emerging evidence which actually supports the contrary some evidence suggests that the muscle sensitivity to the anabolic effects of protein might be increased up to 24 hours after the workout which indicates that this window is a lot larger than previously anticipated there was another study which even investigated the ingestion of protein before and after a workout so one group was getting the protein before they did the training and the one after and the impact on both training groups were actually very similar this is why big bodies of research meta-analysis that includes a lot of different studies have concluded that the total protein intake for the day is much more important 
then when exactly are you going to consume that protein and this should be the primary focus of individuals that want to have adequate muscle recovery. My hot take is that reinforcing this specific belief increases the sales of protein bars, high protein snacks on the go, all of those things, mostly because people could be afraid that if they wait long enough to get home and have some type of other high protein meal, their gains might actually be worse compared to if they had something right away after the workout. And if everybody was indeed under the impression that it is actually not that big of a deal when you eat your protein, the case with the sales of these products might actually be somewhat different. Now let's move into the fifth myth, which is even being reinforced by some scientific papers, and that is plant products cannot be an adequate source of protein. They contain low quality protein that is uncomparable to animal sources of protein. For this, I'm going to take out my whiteboard since it might be a bit hard to explain. I am sorry for the reflection, I'm trying to improve the lightning in the room, but it usually backfires when I take out my whiteboard. The entire idea behind the low quality, high quality protein debate is that animal proteins contain usually all of the essential amino acids in them. You are getting a complete protein for your body to also regenerate its own muscle mass from animal sources. With plant sources, the picture is a bit different. They usually lack one or or more of the essential amino acids, which makes them an incomplete protein, or as some people like to say, a low quality protein. However, that does not mean that you cannot get adequate amounts of protein on such diet, you just have to be a bit more strategic about it. Here, as you can say, we have the cereals group. And in the cereals group, which includes rice, wheat, rye, oats, and all of those things, they are limited, so they are lacking, usually, two essential amino acids. The first one is lysine, this is applicable to all, and the second one is threonine, which is common, but not applicable to all of the cereals that I just mentioned. Legumes are on another group of plant protein sources. Here you get lentils, beans, and chickpeas, and also other types of beans, except soy, I'm going to talk about soy in a bit, they usually are insufficient or completely lacking in methionine and also cysteine. But if you combine cereals with legumes, you're going to get a complete protein. And this is what a lot of plant-based people actually do so that they can get all of the essential amino acids. This is the most common strategy when it comes to eating good amounts of protein for vegan, plant-based people. The case with vegetables, nuts and seeds is a bit different because they lack maybe even more of the essential amino acids. That's why everybody usually recommends to combine these other groups. There are a few exceptions that are complete protein sources such as soy, quinoa, buckwheat, hemp and chia seeds, but you cannot only be eating those specific plant products. Additionally, plant products usually contain lower amounts of leucine, which is the amino acid that is very important for muscle protein synthesis. The only plant source which is somewhat higher in leucine is maize, but how much protein can you technically get from maize if you think about it? Now that you have the whole picture, I need to mention one more important thing. Plant sources have a lot more different metrics compared to animal sources. They contain dietary fiber, they contain phytates, tannins, some enzyme inhibitors, and all of those decrease the digestibility of the plant sources and make the protein a bit harder to absorb. This and also the entire smart combination process is the reason why people who are plant-based might need to consume a bit more protein than people who are not plant-based, specifically because of the digestibility factor. Again, if you want specific numbers, go and watch my previous video on how much protein do you need to be consuming per day. As it already became obvious, you can get good amounts of protein on a plant-based diet. There are also some other things to watch out for on a plant-based diet, such as mineral deficiencies or also vitamin B12 deficiency, but this isn't a topic for another video, here I'm just talking about the amino acids and the protein intake. 
my hot take here is that a lot of the research papers on protein intake are usually with a little bit of a conflict of interests and the scientists that helped write the paper are most of the time involved in some kind of dairy, beef, cattle, egg association, which indicates that they might be somewhat biased when talking about protein sources. There was only one paper that I feel provided a more adequate take on the topic and it also emphasized that for plant proteins they have an advantage in terms of the environmental impact. Yes, they might have a disadvantage as to making protein intake a bit more complicated than usual, but that does not necessarily make them an inadequate protein source. I hope that now I have cleared up some of the misconceptions that you have had around protein. If you had any, let me know down in the comments below if you would like me to do a specific topic next time or if you have genuinely any questions. If you enjoyed today's video, do not forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you do not miss anything new from me. Thank you again very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.